Good morning, Year 6. Okay, for the guided reading session today, it's going to be split into a couple of different activities, okay? So, I'm going to first of all read you Chapter 29. We're then going to do an activity, which includes a video, and then you're going to read Chapter 30 yourself. So, I'm going to, I've got the um, parts of the text on the screen. It's a very short chapter, um, four short pages. So, I'd like you to just read that yourself, and then I will continue later reading Chapter 31, um, as the class read for today. So throughout this guided reading session, you're going to have read two chapters. One I'm going to read to you, and one you will read yourself afterwards. So I'm going to read chapter 29, then we're going to do the activity, and then I'll leave the pages from the book on this video so that you can read and catch up with those um, yourself. Okay, so chapter 29, Pursuit. But we couldn't find him. The exhibition hall was full to bursting. My hand flapped so much that Kat told me to shove it under my jacket. By now, she was reverting to mean, mad, miss catastrophe. And our minds were at polar extremes. We ended up back at the entrance. There were several guards on duty, but the strange man wasn't among them. Kat approached a woman guard who was in the middle of searching somebody's bag. Excuse me, miss, Kat said. The woman looked round, lips turned. What? she snapped. Do you know where Christy is? Christy? What's it to you? He's a friend. I have a message for him. A message? An important message. What about? It's private. Private. Hmm. The woman gave the handbag she was searching back to the owner. He's just radioed. He says he's got a stomach bug. He's leaving for the day. Which means me and my two mates here, we're on our own, right? We've got no time to stand blathering his friends, right? Right, said Kat. With him, it's always the same. Sick this, dentist that, dead uncle the other. Never rains, but it pours. Her lips went down. She shook her head. Ha, huh, just like his name. If you do catch him up on the way to the tube, give him a message from me. I'm sick of him being sick. He needn't come bother coming in tomorrow. He's fired. Fired, I said, thinking of people being burned on the stake in olden days. Fired, sacked, given the boot, take your pick. I stared at her, and so did Cat. Then Cat grabbed me by the sleeve. Hurry, Ted. She dodged past the other people, excited, dragging me with her. I, trot, I trod on three people's feet, but they were big biker men wearing thick back boots, and they didn't notice. We were out in the open air, across the lights, and I had only just time to notice the weather. High strata cloud, fine sunshine, before we were in the tube station, at the ticket barriers, and we glimpsed the strange man walking towards the eastbound platform. It's him, squawked Cat. Hurry. I took the ticket out of my pocket. My hand shook itself hard, so hard I dropped it. Cat screeched. I picked it up. The machine plucked it from my hand and spat it out on top. Pick it up, Ted. Pick it up. I'd forgotten that the barriers don't open until you've retrieved your ticket. I picked it up and ran through and went through. Run! I ran after her, head off to the side. I saw her, herself, hurl herself onto a waiting train. The doors beeped, about to close. I stepped on and got trapped. I felt like I was being squeezed from three dimensions into two. Cat heaved at the doors and yanked me in. Oh, she turned into a tornado, an unstoppable force. He's in the next carriage down, not far from the door. I can see him, she said. I'll keep my eye on him. When We'll get off when he does. It was a rattling old-style tube train that screeched and jerked. We held tight to the bar as it took sharper bends. Sloan Square, Victoria, Blackfriars, Tower Hill, Aldergate East, the tube destination said Upminster. We were going all the way out there. After... Stephanie Green, Cat stood into the, into a, cou a crouch, like a tiger waiting to spring, and dragged me into a stooping position too. He's getting up, she hissed. The train braked. It pulled into Mile End and halted. There was a pause. Seconds ticked by. Everybody waited silently. A man opposite tapped his foot on the floor. With a swoosh, the doors opened. Cat grabbed me and flew off the train, almost knocking over a gentleman trying to board. Sorry, she muttered, pulling me after her by the sleeve of my sweatshirt. She ran behind a, cho a chocolate machine. The strange man was walking briskly down the platform, up a flight of steps. Now, said Cat, I emerged from behind the chocolate machine. Don't run, Cat said. Saunter. Saunter, I said. I'm not good at sauntering, but I did my best. We sauntered up, down the platform, up the steps, through the ticket barrier to the street entrance. Cat spotted him across the street. We crossed two and did some more sauntering behind him. He never looked round. His hands were in his jacket pockets and his head was down as if he was having a, a long train of thought he paused by a corner of some traffic lights and outside a pub called the falcon arms we stopped too 
After a moment, he went inside the pub. It was a large, grubby building with big bay windows and no curtains. It had a drooping white banner across the entrance saying, Open all day. Above it swung a sign showing a picture of a falcon perched on a branch with a mouse in its beak. You could tell from the way the mouse's tail was flying behind that in the picture it was a strong wind, maybe gale force even. And maybe gale force seven. What now? Cat, I said. We wait, Cat said. Wait, I said. As long as it takes. You know what Dad says. What? Pubs are black holes. People go in there and never come out again. He's only joking, Ted. We stood on the street corner for five minutes. Cat got restless. The traffic dreamed by. Cat said she felt like a sore thumb. Her thumb looked fine to me. I was just about to ask what she meant when she said, I'm going to sneak up to that pub window, Ted. You stay put. I watched her sneak forward. She approached the bay window like a double O agent on a mission to save the world. He's propping up the bar, she hissed over to me. I imagined a bar on wobbly trestles, liable to fall down at any moment. She took another look inside. He's got a long glass of dark brown stuff in front of him, and he's hardly touched it, she reported. He's watching TV on the big screen. She re... She rejoined me. He could be in there for some time. Let's cross and wait by the television shop near that bus stop. We can watch TV while we wait, and people just think we're waiting for the bus. We crossed over by the lights and stared at the TV images in the window. People chatting, laughing, shaking their heads, a mid-afternoon game show. We could see but not hear them. We had 18 different TVs to choose from, but they were all tuned to the same channel. The game show ended and the news came on. 18 screens of soldiers in a foreign country walking up dusty streets with heavy guns. 18 screens of African children with flies around their large eyes and no clothes on. You could tell they were starving. 18 screens of the Prime Minister giving a speech at his convention, his two hands shaking themselves out over a podium as he spoke, a bit like mine. Then, 18 screens of our living room, our sofa, times 18, Rashid, times 18, Aunt Gloria with her white sweater and her orange lips and pale cheeks, times 18. She was talking. The cameras went in close. I could see the word, please. Cat gasped. Aunt Glo, Cat squawked. Our living room, on TV. I forgot to tell you, I said. You forgot to tell me. They called the press. The press? They came in a big van. They came while I was gone. Yes, Cat. And you didn't tell me. No, Cat rolled her eyes. I didn't have a chance, Cat. Not with all those motorbikes. We watched as 18 shots of our living room switched to 18 pictures of Salim. The one of him and his school blazer looking neither happy nor sad, then to a telephone number for contacting the police. The story ended. The next was about the latest, miss latest mission to Mars and showed a robotic probe collecting specimens from the planet's crust. Cat stared at it without seeing it, chanting, Our living room, on TV, to herself. I was interested in the pictures of the bare landscape, wondering what the Martian weather would, the Martian weather conditions were like, and if life had might ever have existed there. Neither of us noticed until it was too late. A firm hand grasped my shoulder and Cat's. I turned round. So did Cat. We were face to face with the strange man. He smelled of alcohol. His eyes were slits. His lips were pressed up tight. He knew. I knew what that meant. Anger, extreme. His grip hardened on my shoulder, so it hurt. You again, he hissed. Okay, so we're going to leave it there for now with the reading. Like I say, chapter 30 will be available to you at the end of this video. So we're going to move to a quick activity, okay? Um, so I want to think about today what this experience might have been like for Ted. So what do we know so far about Ted, about how he reacts to situations, and about autism? Okay, so what I want to think about is the exhibition centre, the event where they were, loud noises, motorbikes, all of those things, and then busy tube stations, um, city centre, what might that have looked like and felt like for Ted, and we're going to use a video from the um, National Autistic Society to help us to start to imagine what it may have been like and obviously we know you've done a lot of research on autism you know um, that lots of people feel different things in different ways so this is not what all autistic um, people might feel but this is a video that they use to try and highlight to other people who haven't experienced it what it might feel like to process some of the sensory um, things that are going on around us in everyday life that we might not pick up on, but people with autism 
may focus on a little bit more. So first of all, I want you to think about what you know about TED, what you know about autism. If you need to pause the video to do that, then that's fine. Um, we're then going to have a look at the video, and I want you to think about this question. So how do you think Ted was feeling during the visit to the event center? I want you to give evidence. So how do you think he was feeling? Um, I want you to use some evidence about what we know about Ted. I want you to use some evidence about what we know from autism and I want you to put together some of the things from the video. So here is the video. And so just watch it, listen to it. What's it trying to get across to us? Okay, so there are some there's some more information on the National Autistic um, Society website um, about that, and what I want you to think about is actually how just some of the things that might be going on that you might not always pick up on um, for somebody who has a uh, a sensory overload uh, uh, or, or, or autistic tendencies then um, sensory overload can be a real problem where there's just too much for them to process at the same time and we know that that's something Ted struggles with we also know that that's something that Ted has things uh, ways in which he tries to overcome so he tries to repeat and chant things in his head about things he likes he also um, flaps his hand, shakes his hand out, doesn't he? Which helps, helps him to concentrate back onto what he's doing. So what I'd like to do is use all of that to think about how he might have been feeling during that um, visit to the event centre. Answer that with evidence. And then here are the chapters to the book. So four pages. All I'd like you to do is to read those. You can pause the video on each page and then read as you're going along. Brilliant. Thank you very much and see you soon. soon.